Now I love Mage Knight, but remembering how combat works in this game is a bit challenging. So I'm putting this Mage Knight combat focus video together as part of a Mage Knight series because I know it would help me out, and I'm hoping it would help you out too. Let's just first talk about the various ways you initiate combat with an enemy. One way you can initiate combat is if you decide to enter an unconquered, fortified site like a keep, mage tower, or city. As soon as you do this, you initiate an assault on the defender or defenders that protect that site, and you also lose one reputation, as the citizens of the kingdom frown upon this. Now don't forget the word fortified, as we'll come back to that when we talk about ranged attacks. Another way you can initiate combat is if you enter a keep that has already been conquered, and not by you. This means someone's token other than yours is on the keep. When this happens, if the other player is on the site, you initiate player versus player combat. If this player isn't at the location, then you initiate combat with a gray enemy. Monasteries are a bit different. You initiate combat when you decide to burn a monastery and fight the defender who lives there. Oh yeah, and if you do this, you'll lose three reputation because the citizens of the land really frown upon this. Next, let's talk about adventure sites such as tombs, dungeons, monster dens, spawning grounds, and ancient ruins. You initiate combat in an adventure site if you occupy the adventure site space and also decide to go exploring. You neither lose nor gain reputation at these sites, however, you can occupy the space and not go exploring too. And lastly, let's talk about initiating combat with the two types of rampaging enemies in Mage Knight, Marauding Orcs and Draconum. So you can initiate combat with these enemies in two different ways. First, you can just declare the assault from an adjacent space. Second, you automatically trigger the assault if you move from one adjacent space to another adjacent space. So, if victorious, you gain one reputation for killing a marauding orc, and two reputation for killing a draconum. Let's look at the basic steps of combat. I'll start by making sure you master the basics of how straight up physical combat works against one enemy, and then we'll start to add things like different enemy attacks, resistances, special enemy abilities, and then how combat works against multiple enemies. Player versus player combat is quite different from combat with enemies, so we'll include it in a separate video. Combat in Mage Knight has four phases. Let's quickly look at these phases, and then we'll look at each one in much greater detail. Phase one is called the Ranged Siege Phase. This phase gives you the option to strike the enemy first, but only with attacks that include the word Ranged or Siege as part of the attack name. If you can pull off one of these attacks, it makes for a very quick and painless combat for you but ranged and siege attacks are harder to come by in Mage Knight. Phase two is called the block phase. If the enemy wasn't taken down in the ranged siege step, then the enemy attacks you with the attack value as seen on the left side of the enemy token. You have the option to either block the attack or not block the attack. Phase three is the assigned damage phase. If you block the attack, you can skip to phase four. Otherwise, if you didn't block, then you'll have to assign damage equal to the enemy attack value to your units, hero, or both. And then finally, phase four is the attack phase. This is where you can use a combination of attacks that equal or exceed the armor value, and you'll take down the enemy and collect the fame as shown on the bottom of the enemy token, and possibly even rewards as stated for that location. So let's look deeper at each one of these four combat phases. In the ranged siege phase, you have the opportunity to strike an enemy first before it has a chance to attack you, but only with cards, units, or skills that have the word ranged or siege on them. And cards cannot be played sideways to give you a ranged or siege attack of one 
since ranged and siege attacks are not basic attacks. To successfully perform one of these attacks, you need an attack either equal to or greater than the armor value of the enemy. If you can't put an effective attack together that's equal to or greater than the armor value of the enemy, the attack will be ineffective since the armor value will go back to its original value as soon as the next phase starts. So it's better not to even attempt it, as you'll just waste your resources. Now if either the enemy or the location is fortified, ranged attacks won't work, only siege attacks would work in this circumstance. You can tell if an enemy is fortified if you see one of these little small tower icons next to its armor value. Of course, this would indicate that the enemy you're fighting has a very tough like nails armor. Now enemies don't always have to have the tower icon to be fortified. Any enemy in a keep, mage tower, or a city is considered fortified because if you imagine it, these locations would all have high walls. So again, only siege attacks would work against fortified enemies, not ranged attacks. Now what happens if I fight a fortified enemy in a fortified location like a keep, mage tower, or city? Well, this enemy would be considered double fortified, and in this case, neither range nor siege attacks would be effective. So let's look at a couple examples of the ranged siege phase. First, we'll start with combat against an unfortified enemy. Unless the enemy is fortified, you can combine both ranged and siege attacks together. For example, let's say Goldix encounters a Minotaur with an armor value of 5 in a monster den. Goldix uses his Utem Crossbowman for the ranged attack of 2 and then powers up a crushing bolt with a green mana die from the source to play the siege attack 3. These attacks would combine for a value of 5, and Goldix would defeat the Minotaur before it even has a chance to strike him back. This enemy token would get moved to the discard pile, and Goldix would get the 4 fame as noted in the red banner at the bottom of the Minotaur token. And then because he was in a monster den, he would put one of his markers on the adventure site to mark it as complete, and he would collect the additional reward of 2 random mana crystals following the instructions as noted on the Monster Den information card. Let's look at another combat example, but this time with a fortified enemy. So going back to Goldix's encounter in the Monster Den, let's see what would happen if Goldix would have drawn the Crypt Worm instead of the Minotaur that we saw earlier. Well, the Crypt Worm is a fortified enemy noted here with the tower icon. So all of Goldix's ranged attacks will not work in the ranged siege phase of combat. The only attacks that will work in this phase are siege attacks. And since the only siege attack that Goldix has out of his units, skills, or in his hand is the crushing bolt, and that would need to be powered up with a green mana die he could take from the source, he chooses to pass on this phase since he would only be able to provide 3 points of damage versus the 6 required to defeat the Crypt Worm. He would then move on to Phase 2 of combat, and we do too. Phase 2 is called the Block Phase. If the enemy wasn't taken down in the range Siege step, the enemy attacks you with the attack value as seen in the left side of the enemy token. The icon under the attack value is the attack type, and the fist means that this enemy uses a physical attack, and all blocks work against this type of attack. We'll cover other attacks after we cover the basics. So with the enemy attack, you have the option to either block the attack or not block the attack. To successfully block, you add up the block you play from the cards in your hands that provide block on them, play any card from your hand sideways to provide one block, use block skills that you possess, or activate any unit you control with block abilities. If the block you put together from all of this equals or exceeds the enemy attack value, the enemy does no damage to you and you move straight to phase 4, the attack phase. If you aren't able to block the full amount of the enemy's attack value, the enemy would still deal the full amount of damage, so don't play ineffective blocks as they have no effect on the damage dealt. Before we look at assigned damage, let's look at a couple examples of blocking. Goldix is adjacent to the Prowlers. Since this is a Marauding Orc token, he decides to initiate combat with it since it is adjacent to him. 
He skips the ranged siege phase since he doesn't have any ranged or siege attacks and moves on to the block phase. The Prowlers have an attack of 4, so Goldix plays the card Determination from his hand and powers his card up with a blue mana die he takes from the source. This way he can use the stronger block 5 from this card, and this successfully blocks the Prowlers so they don't deal damage. Let's rewind the last example and show that Goldix could have played the card Determination without powering it up for a block of 2 and then played Stamina and March sideways for one block each. This would provide the 4 block needed to successfully block the Prowler's attack as well, and Goldix could skip Phase 3, assign damage, and move right into Phase 4, which is the attack phase. If Goldix decided he did not want to block, so he could instead use his remaining cards to attack the Prowlers, then he would move directly to Phase 3, assign damage. You would assign damage if you didn't block the attack in Phase 2. Then you assign damage equal to the enemy attack value. You would assign this to your units, hero, or both. To do this, you first decide if you want to assign damage to any of your unwounded units first, and then you assign any remaining damage to your hero next. If you have no unwounded units, or don't want to wound any of your existing unwounded units, then you can just assign all of the damage to your hero. Let's look closer at how you assign damage to your units. So you can assign damage only to unwounded units that you control, and it doesn't matter if the unit is spent or not. That means if you've already put your command token on them for the round or not. The main point with units is that the unit can't be wounded more than once, and if the unit is unwounded, you can only assign damage to them once per combat. To assign damage to one or more of your unwounded units, you first place a wound card on top of your unit, and then subtract the unit's armor value from the value of the enemy's attack. If the value of the armor is greater than the enemy's attack, then the unit absorbs all of the damage, and you can move on to the next phase of combat. But if the armor value of the unit was less than the enemy's attack, you would either have to assign the remaining damage to another unwounded unit, or you can apply the remaining damage to your hero. A hero can be wounded repeatedly, whereas a unit can only be wounded once. When your hero takes damage, you add a wound card to your hand and subtract the armor value as seen on the left side of the level token on your hero card. If there is still damage that needs to be assigned, you would repeat this process until there is no more damage left to assign. So let's look at a couple of examples. Goldix assaults an unconquered keep at night which reveals a swordsman as its defender. Goldix doesn't have any siege attack to strike first. Remember, he can't use range because keeps are always fortified sites. So he looks at the cards in his hand and units that he controls and sees that if he puts together a successful block, he won't have enough attack to take down the swordsman. So Goldix decides to take the sixth damage. Oof. First, he wounds one of his units, and selects his spent peasants. Remember, you have to wound units first. He places a wound card on the unit and subtracts the unit's armor value of 3 from the swordsman attack value of 6. This leaves 3 more points of damage to assign. Goldix has no more unwounded units, so he assigns the remaining 3 points of damage to himself. He takes a wound card to his hand and then subtracts his armor value from the remaining damage. His level token shows his current armor value is 2, so this takes the remaining damage down to 1. Even though there is only one point of damage left to assign, he still has to take another wound card to his hand to take care of the one point of damage. Now that all six points of damage have been assigned, Goldix can move on to phase 4, the attack phase. For another example, let's back up and start the fight with the swordsman over again and say that this time Goldix didn't have any unwounded units to assign damage to. So in this case, he has to assign all of the damage to his hero. So he takes a wound card, adds it to his hand, and subtracts his armor value from the damage. This takes the damage that still needs to be assigned down to 4. He then takes another wound card and subtracts 2 more damage. This takes the remaining damage down to 2. He takes one more wound and subtracts two more from the swordsman's damage, and this reduces it to 0. 
Watch the number of wound cards added to your hand during combat. This doesn't count wound cards you started the combat with, though. If this number equals or exceeds the hand limit as printed on your level token, 5 in the case of Goldix right now, you're knocked out. When you are knocked out, you immediately discard all non-wound cards from your hand. So if you do get knocked out, your units could still continue to fight, and you could use your skills if you have any. And oh yeah, if you have to continue taking wounds, which I hope you never get in that situation, you can still take more wounds to your hand even though you're knocked out. Phase 4 is called the attack phase. After the enemy attacks, you now have the option to either attack the enemy or not attack the enemy. You've made it this far, I hope this battle wasn't all for naught. To successfully attack, you add up the attack you play from your cards in your hand that provide attack on them. Even ranged or siege cards count in this phase, even if the enemy is fortified. You can also play any card from your hand sideways to provide one basic attack. You can use attack skills that you possess, or you can activate any units you control with attack abilities. Enemies we're looking at now have no resistance. We'll talk about resistance a bit later. For enemies with no resistance, you can combine ranged, siege, fire, ice, or cold fire attacks for your attack phase, and add all of these different attacks together. If your attack equals or exceeds the enemy armor value, you defeat the enemy and collect the fame as indicated at the bottom of the enemy token. Sometimes an enemy defeat even earns you additional rewards and lets you place your shield token on the site. Always check location cards to see exactly what happens after a successful combat. If you aren't able to put together an attack for the full amount of the enemy's armor value, the combat is over. You would leave the enemy token in locations such as unconquered keeps, mage towers, cities, monster dens, and spawning grounds, but you would discard the enemy token in a tomb, dungeon, or monastery. Some of what happens if you do or don't defeat the monster token is hard to remember. At least it is for me. So I recommend using location reference cards and the walkthrough guide as a reminder. Let's look at some attack examples. So let's rewind a bit to the example where Goldix blocks the swordsman during the block phase. Now he gets to attack. He plays the card Rage from his hand for an attack of two, and then plays a card Swiftness and powers this up with a white crystal from his inventory to provide the ranged attack three. Remember, you can combine these different attacks. So this gives him a total attack of five, which equals the armor value of the Swordsman. Goldix is victorious and collects the four fame and discards this token. He would also now place his shield token on the keep to show that he owns it. For another example, let's say Goldix has a different set of cards, units, and skills. He has just finished the assigned damage phase against the swordsman because he decided to save his resources for the attack. Now that it is the attack phase, Goldix spends his Utem crossbowmen for the round to use their attack 3 ability. He uses his freezing power skill for a siege 1 attack, and he plays Threaten Sideways for one additional attack, to equal a total of five, which again takes down the Swordsman. If he wasn't able to put together a successful attack, he would retreat to the same space he came from when he entered the keep. So now that you have the basics of combat down, you might have looked at some of the other tokens in the box and said, Pete, what are all these other symbols and colors for on these other tokens? Well, if you feel you're ready, then we move on to show you the greater world of combat. Otherwise, just review the last section again. All enemy attacks we've dealt with so far have been physical attacks. Enemies with physical attacks have the fist icon beneath their attack value, like our beloved friends the Prowlers, Swordsmen, and Minotaur we saw earlier. Now it's time to look at three other types of attacks that your enemies can possess, and you can too, but we'll wait just a bit to talk about that. The three new attacks are Fire, Ice, and Cold Fire. You'll start to see enemies with these attacks when you reveal Mage Tower, Draconum, or City enemy tokens. Enemies with Fire attacks have this red fiery icon under their attack value. Enemies with Ice attacks have this blue icy looking icon, and enemies with Cold Fire attacks 
have a red and blue icon under the attack value on their token. When your enemies use these attacks against you, there are some blocks that will be fully efficient, meaning 6 points of block stop 6 points of attack, and other blocks that are only half as efficient, meaning 12 points of block would be needed to stop 6 points of attack. If you don't block these attacks, the damage still equals just the attack value. So let's look at what's efficient and what's not. So if your enemy uses a fire attack against you, only an ice block or cold fire block will be fully efficient against it. Fire blocks or just basic blocks will only be half as efficient. For an ice attack, only a fire block and cold fire block would be fully efficient. And if your enemy uses a cold fire attack, only a cold fire block would be fully efficient against it. So the moral of the story is a cold fire block is fully efficient against all types of other attacks, although they're really hard to get. The opposite element is fully efficient for either a fire attack or an ice attack. And if you ask, can I use fire, ice, and cold fire blocks against physical attacks? The answer is yes. All blocks are fully efficient against physical attacks. Now, when you're blocking against an enemy with fire, ice, or cold fire attack, you can also combine fully efficient blocks with half efficient blocks. Let's look at a couple of examples to get the gist of what I'm talking about here. Goldix has assaulted a mage tower and is now in combat with the ice mage who's defending it. Goldix didn't have any siege attack to defeat him during the range siege phase, so he has the option to block the ice mage's ice attack of 5. To block, Goldix uses his guardian golems and activates their fire block 4 ability with a red mana token he got earlier in the turn. This reduces the ice mage's ice attack down to 1. To block this remaining point, Goldix plays two cards from his hand sideways for a basic or physical block, too. Since a physical block is only half as efficient against an ice attack, Goldix had to play two points to block the one remaining point of ice. For another example, Goldix fights the Fire Golem, who has a fire attack of three. And since he doesn't have any ice block or cold fire block, he uses the card Determination, powered up with the blue mana crystal he had in his inventory, to use the block 5, and then plays one card sideways to bring his block up to 6. Since this type of block is only half as efficient, 6 points successfully blocks the fire attack 3 the fire golem throws at him. Now that we understand different enemy attacks, let's look at something else new we haven't seen yet. Resistance. If you see these small black, red, or blue pentagon icons up by the enemy armor value, this means that the enemy has a resistance to a certain type or types of attack. But it doesn't mean the enemy is completely resistant to a certain type of attack. I'll explain. The black resistance symbol means the enemy has a resistance to physical attacks. This means that all of your physical attacks, like attack 4, or ranged attack 3, or siege attack 2, are only half as efficient against this enemy. And by half as efficient, that means that if I attack using physical attack, I would need an attack of 2 to reduce the enemy's armor value by 1. If the enemy has the red fire resistance icon, all attacks that have fire in the title are only half as efficient against this enemy. If ice resistant with the blue icon, ice attacks are only half as efficient as well. Now watch out because enemies who have both ice and fire resistant are resistant to ice, fire, and even cold fire attacks. Enemy resistance applies during the ranged siege phase and the attack phase. And one more thing, if an enemy has fire resistance, not only are fire attacks halved, but if you activate any non-attack or non-block effects from a red card or from spells and units that take red mana to activate, those have no effect against fire-resistant enemies. Likewise, the same is true for ice-resistant enemies. If you activate any non-attack or non-block effects from a blue card or from spells and units that take blue mana to activate, those have no effect against ice-resistant enemies. Let's look at an example of resistance. 
Goldix is in combat at a mage tower with an ice golem, who has an armor of four and has physical and ice resistance. During his attack phase, Goldix uses a firebolt that he powers up with a red mana die from the source to get the ranged fire attack three, and then uses the card Rage for an attack two. The ranged fire attack three is fully efficient against the ice golem, and that takes his armor value down to one. Since the attack two from Rage provides physical attack, this is only half as efficient, but enough to reduce the last point of armor. So Goldix is victorious and collects the five fame, places his shield token on the mage tower, and collects a spell from the spell offer. So that's how resistance works for your enemies. Now let's look at how resistance works for your units. If you see the same resistance icons next to your unit's armor value, it means that unit has specific resistance to whatever the icon shows, physical, fire, or ice. Resistance your units have is valuable during the assign damage phase. You can assign damage up to the unit's armor value without wounding the unit. If the damage exceeds the armor value, then you would wound the unit and continue to assign damage normally. So if our beloved swordsmen were unblocked during combat, the six physical damage they inflict would need to be assigned. Goldix controls the guardian golems with an armor value of three and ta-da, physical resistance. We assign all six damage to the golems. Three points of damage gets assigned to the golems without wounding them, and then we place a wound card on the golems and assign the three remaining damage to them. You may have noticed that some enemies, actually a lot of enemies, have additional icons on the right side of their enemy tokens. What do all these mean? Well, I'll cover them here, but you may not remember all of them, so you can refer to the last page of the rulebook as reference for these, and many of the other things we've looked at already. Let's look at the three enemy abilities that add additional damage effects, and these make for a really good reason you'd want to block these enemies. These are Brutal, Poison, and Paralyze. If the enemy has this skull-looking icon, it means it deals brutal damage. When this enemy deals damage, the damage value is doubled. This means a brutal attack of 3 can either be blocked by block 3, or it goes through as 6 points of damage. The green drop icon means the enemy deals poison damage. Poison damage dealt to units means that the units take two wound cards instead of just one, and also would need to be healed two times to remove these wounds. If the poison damage is applied to your hero, then for every wound card you add to your hand, you also add one wound card to your discard pile. Poison is delayed and will sicken you next round when you shuffle your discard pile. The statue icon is Paralyze. This icon reminds me of the 80s era Clash of the Titans where the head of Medusa turns the Kraken into stone when I look at this one. When enemies with this icon deal damage to a unit, the unit is automatically destroyed and put back in the box. If this damage is dealt to your hero, you would discard all non-wound cards from your hand and then take wounds as normal. The only attack you could muster in the next phase would be with skills or unwounded units. Now, let's look at two icons that don't have to do with damage. The first is this airplane-looking bird icon, which is called Swift, and means that the enemy is twice as hard to block. An enemy with Swift, attack of three, can either be blocked by block six, or if you choose not to block, it just does the normal three damage to you in the next phase. The next icon we'll talk about is debatable whether it's a special ability or not, as you'll see it actually replaces the attack icon, as it is the summon attack ability. When you fight enemies with this ability, if you don't defeat the enemy during the ranged siege phase of attack, you actually draw a brown enemy token for just the block and assign damage phase. Then you discard that enemy and attack the original enemy. For example, Goldix fights an orc summoner and doesn't have enough ranged or siege attack to defeat it in phase one, 
So he draws a brown enemy token and has the option to either block the attack of the werewolf with a swift attack of 7, meaning he would need a block of 14, or else he takes 7 damage. Oof. And Goldix decides not to block and assign the 7 damage. 3 to his peasants and then 4 to himself, adding 2 wound cards to his hand because his armor value is still only 2. After assigning damage, he discards the werewolf. By the way, no fame is awarded from the werewolf. And then he attacks the summoner orc using his card Rage and Determination for an attack of 4. Learning how to deal with multiple enemies at once should now be a piece of cake since we're at this point. When dealing with multiple enemies, you resolve each phase of combat with all enemies before moving to the next phase. However, the ranged siege phase and the attack phase allow you to either group enemies together to handle them as one giant enemy, or you can attack each one separately. Now you may want to attack enemies as a group if you have a really powerful attack that would be wasted fighting enemies one-on-one. -on -one. The restriction when attacking enemies as a group, though, is that if one of them has resistance or fortification, all enemies have to be treated as if they have this resistance or fortification too. If you attack enemies separately during the range siege or attack phases, then you would deal with each one just like we did in the examples where Goldix just fought one enemy at a time. During the block phase, for every enemy you did not defeat in the ranged siege phase, you first decide which ones you'll block and which ones you won't. For those you block, you deal with and resolve each blocked enemy separately, just as Goldix did during our examples when he blocked one enemy. Then, in the next phase, you deal damage from all of the enemies you decided not to block to your units first and then to your hero. For example, Goldix moves to a hex on the board with Ancient Ruins. Since there has been a day around since this tile was revealed, the Ruins token is already flipped face up to show us that if you explore the Ruins, you'll have to fight both a brown and purple enemy at the same time to receive the spell and four mana crystals. Goldix is feeling pretty confident and decides to end his movement here and enter the ruins. His brown token reveals a werewolf, and the purple token reveals an illusionist. In phase one, he doesn't have enough ranged or siege attack to defeat the werewolf, and even though it looks like a ranged attack three could take down the illusionist, this enemy has physical resistance, so the three points of ranged attack would only be half of what is needed to defeat this enemy. Remember, unless there is fire, ice, or cold fire in the name of the attack, all attacks are considered physical. Since there's nothing Goldix can do, he moves to the block phase. With multiple enemies, block takes place one at a time. This should get interesting with the abilities these enemies have. Since the werewolf has a swift attack of 7, it would take a block of 14 to successfully block. So Goldix decides not to block the werewolf and save his cards for the attack phase. Then he moves on to block the illusionist. Since this is a summon attack, he draws a brown enemy token and reveals a gargoyle that he decides to block. Remember, all you have to do is deal with either the blocking or dealing of damage with the summoned enemy. Goldix uses the block 2 from his guardian golems and the block 3 from his foresters for the block 5 needed to successfully block the gargoyles. He discards the gargoyles and then moves on to the deal damage phase to take the 7 damage from the unblocked werewolf. He decides to assign his foresters 4 damage and then assigns the remaining 3 to his hero and takes 1 moon card to his hand. Since the illusionist has physical resistance and the werewolf does not, Goldix decides to fight them both separately. He uses a red mana die from the source to use the flame wall spell to defeat the illusionist, and then he uses his red mana crystal to use the stronger power of improvisation, which requires him to discard a card from his hand to use the attack 5. So he discards swiftness and strikes the werewolf with the attack 5. Since he defeats both enemies, he gets a whole bunch of stuff. He collects 9 fame from defeating the enemies, marks the ruined space with one of his shield tokens, 
chooses a spell from the spell offer to add to the top of his deed deck, and then gains the white, green, red, and blue mana crystals to add to his inventory. So thanks for watching. I know that's a lot about combat. I tried to make this comprehensive enough and maybe too comprehensive so you can dive in and just play now. But I didn't want to provide every little situational nuance of the game. I'm hoping it works for you. Please leave me some feedback in the comments, and remember, if you like the style of how to play video, please let your friends know about my channel, and remember to like and subscribe. Thanks again, and see you next time.